Before you could go to church on a Sunday, there was a definite arrangement that everybody would go to confession on the Saturday, confess all of their sins, be forgiven, get an appendix such as saying the Hail Mary or Hail Marys and the Our Fathers. Then on a Sunday, you could all go up uh, at a certain, certain time of the service in church and receive Holy Communion. Because if you didn't receive all the communion, that meant you were still kneeling or sat on the bench. That means people would know you were a sinner. So you couldn't be a sinner. So you imagine all the nuns and everybody else in the carers gone to the confessional box and automatically forgiveness, if they ever did confess to what they were doing, it wouldn't make any difference to the priest anyway. You'd have to be forgiven so you could receive all the communion. No sinners in church. Wow, isn't that amazing? And so, yeah, by Monday morning, I mean, it goes something like this. Mr. So-and-so is a very holy man, and he goes to church on Sunday. He prays to God to give him strength to whack the boys on a Monday. And that's a song that we used to sing. Because that, that kind of sums it up, doesn't it, really? <laughs> you you clearly done something wrong because you were punished so severely, but you'd have to, to have some kind of a head to work out what it is that you've done wrong. So what sins could you have committed? Did you look at yourself when you washed yourself? Did you look at your privates? Probably. You might even touch them when you're washing yourself. Was that a sin? Well, it wasn't very holy, apparently. If you said that you were looking at your private parts and doing something that you shouldn't be doing with your private parts, it, that priest would take an awful lot of notice of you. Now, I'm not saying every priest. I'm just talking about the ones that did it. And somehow, that sin was then relayed back to the um, the particular nun in charge of your level in the orphanage, either whether you're a bottom junior or a top junior. And you would be brought into a place called the workroom and explain what it was that you admitted to in confession. So you now have to repeat or remember exactly what it was, not just that you'd done what you said to the priest, so that they could help you out with the problem. That's a pretty sick thought, isn't it? We knew that what they were doing was, was a massive sin, but not according to religion, of course. It was a crime, actually, what they did. It was more than a sin. It was a crime. I am coming back here and I have control. Nobody's going to make me do anything here, except if they don't want me and I have to leave, then I will leave. But, you know, the fact that I'm standing here and saying what I want to say, in the way that I want to say it, and for the rest of the boys, is like a record breaker, to say the least. It's never been done. We've never come back here and study like this, ever. It's been a place of dread, of fear, of pressure, of doing stuff you didn't want to do, stuff you didn't understand, stuff you didn't, it, it didn't really enjoy at all. It was just a show. It's another thing you had to do. But, uh, I don't have that feeling now. It's um, and I haven't spoken to anybody. It doesn't feel a threat to me anymore. It doesn't feel threatening. The original confession box was here, and it, all it had was a curtain that you like a screen part where you went into, you knelt down, and you confessed all these sins that you committed every week. So that you could be forgiven, so that you could repent, and that you were punished by um, Hail Mary's and our fathers, and you could go to Holy Communion again uh, and start the whole process over and, and commit sins from Monday to Saturday and be forgiven on Saturday afternoon and back up to take Holy Communion. It's a quite a pointless cycle of, well, it was a circus, I think. Another happy circus, so to speak. So on here, these would have nameplates for what we would know as the IPs, teachers, doctors, anybody but us. Because free work, homeboys, and we would sit somewhere from here all the way back. So you'd have the babies, you'd have the bottom juniors, you'd have the top juniors, and you'd have the seniors. And this, pretty much this side was occupied. And that over there was mounted on that column and the priest would then be looking when I say down I'm not don't mean that unkindly but the fact is he was up there on a pedestal if you like looking down on the congregation and thankfully modernization and modern way of thinking he's got it on a level of, of, of people and over there on the altar in that middle bit there's actually a flight of steps going it's called the tabernacle and we would have to go up there and take off and whatever was in it, and usually a, a big brass cross. And you stand here with your enormous uh, staff with a brass cross on it, really shiny. And the 
the priest and two of the boys who were to be standing there. And at the 12, 13 station of the cross, the Lord was taken down and all that kind of stuff. It was quite tedious and it really made a fat lot I had to say. Although, you know, when you look and you see anybody in that state, you can't help it. You feel sorry for him. And he's got what looks like mothers and people wanting to help him. But sadly, there weren't anybody helping us. But he got the help that we needed. We needed to be taken off this cross that we were on. And it didn't happen, I'm afraid. But, uh, you know, we looked to him. <laughs> Good luck to him.